This episode of Adventures Through the Mind podcast is brought to you by the Spirit Plant Medicine Conference happening November 3rd to the 5th in Vancouver, BC, Canada. You can join online uh, and watch virtually or join in person at, uh, at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, where I will be. Thumbs up. Very excited. Um, by heading to jameswgesso.com forward slash SPMC. If you use the promo code ADVENTURES, A-D-V-E-N-T-U-R-E-S, uh, you will get 30% off your ticket, that being an in-person ticket or online. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Adventures Through the Mind, a podcast that explores topics relevant and related to psychedelic culture, medicine, and research, and always with the underlying question of how we can work with and through our psychedelic experiences to become better people, not just for ourselves, but for all those with whom we are nested in relationship, presently and across time, human and non-human alike. I'm your host, as always, James W. Gesso. This podcast is uh, with, this episode of the podcast is an interview with Acacia Lewis and is going to predominantly explore the value and the risk of very high dose psilocybin experiences, psilocybin mushroom experiences. We're talking 20 plus grams of psilocybin mushrooms. Um, there's two predominant arcs in this, uh, one of which is Acacia's journey in using and working with high dose mushroom experiences, their impact on her life and her, her sense of self. And also the work of Kalindi E. Yee, uh, the late Kalindi E. Yee, who was at least in the modern psychedelic Renaissance, one of the first people, perhaps the first person to step up and say, hey, there's exploratory value um, to taking very high doses of psilocybin mushrooms. Um, now, I will read you uh, Acacia's bio to get us start us off. Start, excuse me, started off here. Acacia Lewis is a devoted researcher and educator in the field of entheogenic psychoactive substances, particularly the sacred psilocybin mushroom. She is the founder of Divine Master Academy LLC, Divine Master University, and KIM uh, Cambo Iboga Mushroom and Mushroom uh, Academy with a mission to educate on plant and fungi medicine. Acacia has earned recognition such as the Cosmic Sister Emerging Voices Award for her work, and based in Oakland, California, she actively supports psychedelic communities globally, often sharing her insights on various podcasts, like this one. This interview explores a number of vignettes into Acacia's scholarly explorations of psychedelic mushroom use throughout history, most especially in the ancient African traditions. But as I mentioned just a moment ago, the two thematic arcs, the two main thematic arts that we travel through in this interview are the work of the late Kalindi Iyi, who has previously been on the show. Uh, I'll leave a link to that in the show notes to this episode or on a YouTube card if you're watching this on YouTube, um, as well as the potential, potential value, potential risks of high dose psilocybin experiences as a form of martial arts practice. Um, the value and risk being filtered primarily through Acacia's personal explorations in that domain. We end this interview with a little bit of a taster for the talk she's going to be giving at the upcoming Spirit Plant Medicine Conference, Vancouver, BC, November 3rd to the 5th, um, which includes one talk on the evolution of humanity from here onwards into the future, as well as uh, crystals as a psychedelic technology. Before we get into the interview, a big thanks to my patrons on Patreon who help make this podcast possible. Their membership and ongoing voluntary financial contributions to the uh, to the expenses, time and otherwise, time and financial to the show are an absolutely vital aspect of my ability to continue putting into not just the production of the show, but the larger body of work that supports it, most especially right now, 
writing a book, uh, which I am presently real, <laughs> real deep in. Uh, so a huge thanks to you, my patrons. I could not be doing this without your support, both in the financial realm, but also in the sense of feeling as though there's people out there on the receiving end of this that find value in it. You know, what is the point and the purpose of a podcast like this if it doesn't feel as though it's bringing value into somebody's life? And you help remind me of that. So thank you very much. If you are not yet a patron of the show and you would like to become a part of the Patreon community that supports the show and my larger body of work, you can head to patreon.com forward slash James W. Gesso. The link to that will be on the show notes to this episode, wherever you're checking it out, and sign up there. As you might have noticed, there's been a change in Patreon recently, which allows people to become followers of creators on the platform without having to put in a financial uh, monthly contribution. So if you are not in a place where you're able to offer something financial, but you'd like to kind of break the algorithm's hold on the things that come into your attention through social media feed, you can directly follow me on uh, Patreon as the company Patreon is attempting to, I guess, subvert the whole algorithm movement um, and help you stay in, in connection, in contact with the content of the creators that you care about. So if I'm one of them, yeah, follow me on Patreon. Uh, if you are interested in contributing financially, but not monthly, you can do a donation through PayPal or through cryptocurrency, if that's your thing. Links to that are in the description to this episode. Again, wherever you're checking it out or here on YouTube, if that's where you're watching it. And uh, I'll see you on the other side. Acacia Lewis, welcome to Adventures Through the Mind. Thank you. Um, I'm really honored to be on here again. <laughs> and, <laughs> um, round round have one having been... Share. Yeah, round one having been lost maybe forever to the to the uh, to, to the ether of failing mechanical drives and poor cloud data management on my end. Um, so yes, very much appreciating you uh, giving us your time again, um, even if listeners won't know uh, what the first one was all about. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, you know, to the best to the best of what's possible, we'll try to. Like lean into the same backbone of the last conversation, and uh, I want to start off with uh, sort of, I guess, opening the conversation up um, with a little bit of your background about how you came to work with psilocybin mushrooms, particularly in higher doses, um, and uh, and also where your friendship with Kin Kalindi Yi fits inside of your journey with mushrooms. <sighs> All right. So I'll repeat the question. Basically, you know, a little bit of my background and how um, I became aware of Kalindi's work. Is that what you're asking? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess it's something to the effect of like giving us the uh, the basis of how you stepped into the mushroom work um, and where Kalindi, you know, what role Kalindi played in, in supporting oh. your, your journey into and through the mushroom work to where you are now. Well, I will say... Um, I was into mushrooms a long time before I heard about Kalindi. Like actually I was, I was watching his YouTube videos, but I hadn't actually talked to him yet. It took me several years to form the actual wherewithal to talk and say, hi, <laughs> I'm out here watching your YouTubes. Um, and that was on a, on a trip and a fateful night in the desert. And, um, I had about 14 grams of mushrooms um, and some Syrian roux, and I ate the mushrooms in Syrian roux and had the trip of my existence and proceeded to call him at 3 a.m. during the trip and ask him why he wasn't talking about quantum physics and the Sierpinski triangle and supersymmetry and all this other stuff. And he told me to call me when I came down, and that's how we eventually started talking. But before that, um, my first boyfriend, Osiris, introduced me to mushrooms. And um, I was, I think it was around my 16th birthday. Um, I had the amazing opportunity to go to an eternal harmony gathering. And I was actually really depressed. Um, I'd actually been considering suicide. And it was because of a bad relationship that I had just gotten out of. And um, Osiris found me uh, a mushroom plug and was like, okay, well, we're going to surprise you for your birthday. 
Um, they made sure I didn't have to drive home. They took my motorcycle down to Houston and uh, went to this dude's house. And he's got all of these freaking digital um, sunshine, you know, you know, sunshine 3D tapestries, you know, that you can buy the hippie tapestries. He had tons of those and all the lights and DJ equipment and stuff. Typical like trip, trip, tripper, you know, um, trip, trip, tripper. That's a good one. Um, and, uh, yeah, he, he gave me his Penelius Hawaii cause that's what he was trying to test out. And I didn't really understand most mushrooms or potency or anything. I didn't understand what was happening at that time. And they gave me the mushrooms at a chocolate bar and took me to the Houston Museum of Natural Science and then laid me out on the lawn. And I ate my mushrooms and my chocolate bar and proceeded to have my first trip. And it was amazing. It was so amazing. In fact, I was upset that someone hadn't told me about mushrooms sooner. But then I realized they had, but I didn't understand it because I hadn't experienced it yet. Um, and I started out around seven grams. I didn't start out at a really low dose. I started out a pretty good dose. It was like a dime bag size, but it's like that. So back then, you know, mushrooms were just kind of these black crusty things in a bag for me. <laughs> uh, very sporulated and very dense and compressed. And, um, you open up the bag and pulled apart these unrecognizable fruits and tried to choke them down as fast as possible. Um, but yeah, that's, you know, for me at that time it was really vulnerable because I had just left, left, uh, SMU. I had been studying astrophysics and geophysics at Southern Methodist university as a teenager. And I had just run out of money for my, my schooling. So I, I had enlisted in the military right before my first mushroom trip. And so I was due to go in around 17 or 18. And I think I, I got accepted at 17, went to basic training at 18. Um, yeah. And um, I spent about three years in the military before I got into a car accident and ended up without a job in the military. And I got extremely depressed after that because uh, I felt like, well, I didn't finish my astrophysics degree. I didn't finish my military uh, training because I was supposed to go to tech school for SOWAT training. Um, and so I just felt very incomplete and like my life was a waste. And so I tried to take my life again like age 21 and um actually that was like age 20 and i had just met my best friend uh who i had decided to get engaged to uh mike and uh, mike was part of the reason why i got discharged because mike was identifying as a transgender um individual and um in the military we still had don't ask don't tell and so because i had decided to get publicly married to my best friend um my First sergeant, who was not the same first sergeant who was there when I was in basic training, decided to tell me that I was on voluntary obligations only. And so um, he could send me to mental, uh, which is our mental health center. And he got me checked out and that they didn't have an excuse to discharge me. So he used the fact that I was getting married to my wife, which he misgendered my partner at that time, um, and as an excuse to kick me out of the military. And so I was, if my mental health wasn't bad before that day, it got incredibly bad after that day. Um, and, um, so, um, me and my partner eventually saved up after I lost my job. I was ended up living in the car with my, my partner for some years and we went back to Texas and I introduced my partner to the person who introduced me to mushrooms, the same guy who gave me my first dose. And he gave us as many mushrooms as we wanted. <laughs> And, um, we started doing work, um, with the mushroom, not at high dose, I'll say like around five to 10 grams each, um, starting then when I was about 20. Um, and that was when the work became more consistent afterwards. Um, and eventually, uh, about a year later, I got in touch with Kalindi and, I had already been interested in his work, but I hadn't really interacted with him. And he posted his phone number on Facebook one day. I saved his phone number and then I called him. And so don't post your phone number out there, psychonauts. That's <laughs> someone actually might call you during a trip. And um, we became friends after that. You know, he didn't talk much, but I just saw him as the crazy old mushroom man um, that I could tell about my experiences and 
you know, I was reframing my experience in academia into the psycho spiritual model. So coming from astrophysics and geophysics and taking skeptical sciences, you know, um, well, pseudoscience class at SMU, um, how to debunk pseudoscience and metaphysics, I was not really buying, you know, any of my psychedelic experiences as spiritual whatsoever. Um, I saw them as hallucinations very much, but I was kind of tongue in cheek about them being hallucinations because some of the things made sense that I was seeing, but I was willing to give myself the benefit of the doubt that there might be a reason they make sense. And I didn't really find any reason for them to make sense after the first five years, you know? Um, and I watched some of Kalindi's videos and some of the things he was saying, I didn't believe. So I did research on, with my undergraduate research background, trying to debunk a lot of the stuff he was saying. And um, I found out that a lot of it checked out. A lot of it was still theoretical um, about the multiverse, et cetera. But that there really were like foundational blueprints of ancestral or ancient mushroom use. Not even really ancient, but I will say definitely before the modern era. Um, and you know, now people like Paul Stamets are going to Egypt and saying, oh, the Egyptians were doing mushrooms. But, um, the truth is Kalindi had already been to Egypt 20 years before that. And he was studying, you know, the hieroglyphics on the wall that showed mushroom use and making correlations and connections before the Western psychedelic community was even aware or present to the fact that, yeah, there is this hidden link in Africa, but, um, when you go to Africa, you can't buy the secrets of these different, initiatory groups you have to actually initiate you know um hati kalindi igi was installed as a Ghanaian chief a lot of people don't understand that you actually have to be part of these warrior societies to get the information from what they were using he didn't just come up with it in his mind that oh you know uh panther warriors were eating mushrooms no the panther warriors who are still around taught him about their rituals and the context of the initiations he received as a traditional martial artist in Africa. And a lot of people say, oh, well, martial arts comes from Asia, right? But um, martial arts in Africa come from dance. And because we only see the dance, we understand that West African dance goes back tons and tons of years, you know, like tens of thousands of years. But we don't equate dance with martial arts, but the dance is weaponized to become martial arts. That's how we're trained. And the animal systems are a part of that training. Um, and I didn't understand that. And I was super fascinated because my dad's a martial artist. And so, you know, <laughs> eventually, you know, I became very interested in hearing more of what Kalindi had to say about martial arts and mushrooms because um, martial arts and mushrooms is something that I could imagine my dad doing. Of course, <laughs> he probably didn't um, in the 60s, but who knows? You know, I mean, um, my dad was r roller skating and he's super into Earth, Wind and Fire and parliament funkadelic and the mothership connection and Kalindi's into that kind of stuff too so I felt like it was helping me to understand more of the African-American humanities behind mushroom use like the culture of psychedelia inside of what it means to be an African-American in this country in the 60s and 70s during the first psychedelic revolution or renaissance in our country that was um, partially in part due to Woodstock and all the themes that were going on back then. Um, Gordon R. Wasson bringing mushrooms to the United States and then mushrooms and LSD becoming kind of the, the hippie drug of choice. <laughs> um, it helped me to understand that um, a lot of these ideas or these themes about funky aliens and shit came from people's trips, you know? And I was like, well, I don't trip about stuff like that. Does that mean I'm broken? I don't see aliens and I don't see like, you know, DMT elves like Terrence McKenna talked about. None of the visuals that Terrence McKenna talked about, I could relate to. I was not seeing DMT elves. I was not seeing Smurfs. I was not seeing uh, jesters. I was not seeing any of that stuff. The kind of stuff that I was seeing was like, like walls coming up out of the ground that build actual structures. I was seeing structures energetically. And I wasn't seeing like sacred geometry on the walls. I was seeing it on the floors and the framework, but it was like my brain was taking the physics lessons that I had learned in college and applying my knowledge to my, my psychedelic experience. So I was like, well, 
does what you what does what you're interested in affect your psychedelic experience? And then I realized that yeah, I mean it's got to because when psilocybin is binding to 5H2A receptors, those are learning and memory molecules. So if you have been historically interested in aliens, you're probably going to see aliens. If you've been historically interested in um, Egypt, you're probably going to see Egyptian gods. But if you're interested in astrophysics and geophysics, you might see some stuff that is in line with your beliefs about science and metaphysics of reality. And I didn't really understand the connection between my academic background and being homeschooled to my mushroom trips. My mushroom trips were very mathematical. They were very much experimental. Um, I was trying to test certain laws or universal theorems of consciousness inside of my mushroom experiences because that's what I was interested in. I wasn't interested in aliens. I mean, I am now because everyone's talking about it, but Back then, you know, coming out as an autistic kid into the psychedelic world, like, that was the last thing I could care about was seeing flowers and smiley faces, you know? Um, I wanted to see how I could expand my knowledge of the universe through my human experience, through experiencing um, these conscious states. Um, and so, I didn't so, know that that's... Okay, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in for a second. Are you, if I'm getting this right, you, you know, you were, I'm assuming like quite a quote gifted child. If you're at a university studying astrophysics and geophysics at 16, mm -hmm. eventually mm -hmm. what I'm hearing is like, you're taking that sort of rigor and that capacity for mm -hmm. learning and understanding and applying it directly into the experiences that you're having and trying to make sense of sort of mm -hmm. like what's arising in your psychedelic experience, what it means and how it connects, integrating the knowledge, wisdom, shared experiences of others. And then Kalindi Yi comes in, he becomes a significant sort of like a reference point for that, that learning process that you're in. Um, is that right? Well, I actually thought Kalindi was full of crap. And so like I challenged him a lot. Like I was well, sending that, him messages. That, still, that could still <laughs> function as a significant sort of like learning like influence on your learning if you're using it as exactly. like a, right? Yeah, yeah, because because I didn't believe what he was saying initially, it forced me to become like a citizen scientist about the stuff he was talking about because I wanted to see like, oh, this is just pseudoscience. Because, you know, Randall J. Scalise, I'll give you props if you're watching this out there. You're the best teacher at pseudoscience. Keep doing what you're doing. I absolutely did not believe in anything spiritual and everything that you said made sense. But... Now I'm one of those people <laughs> who's talking about things we can't test or see. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, you know, uh, Kalindi, Kalindi brought up another level that interested me, which was, uh, was the anthropological sciences, which are a science, you know, um, looking at the different patterns of esoteric symbols and Egypt or in China or in Tibet and learning about them through the spiritual traditions that work with those uh, plants or fungi. Like Kalindi didn't just talk about Egyptian history. He was initiated into the warrior priest societies that were still descended from people who practice comedic rituals. And we're not talking about hoteps. We're not talking about the people who put Black Cleopatra and Netflix, we're talking about Egyptian mycologists. We're talking about historians. We're talking about people who understood the view of the ancient Kemetic priest from a historical and spiritual point of view. He was studying under greats, you know, in Africa and in Egypt. And because of that, he had a unique perspective about the Necheru about these gods that we call in the West, um, Bastet and, and Osset and Asar and Osiris, you know, um, there was an article put out a couple of decades ago about the relationship between the Asarian crown or the crown of Osiris and mushroom fruits, you know, um, but if you want to get even more direct than that, these underworld myths aren't talking about something that we can just access without psychedelics. So it really, when you, when you study the actual priesthood of, you know, Bastet or Aset or of Amun or the cult of Osiris, 
when you study these traditions, of course, I didn't get the irony of someone named Osiris introducing me to mushrooms until 10 years later. So just so you know, like I, I had no fucking clue that there was a connection like between, you know, the Egyptian studies and mushrooms um, until much later. Um, but the actual rites of passage would be consuming mushrooms and then giving mushrooms to these um, people who were uh, passing away uh, or who had passed away as part of the opening of the mouth ritual <clears throat> and um, con communicating with them and helping them on their journey on the other side. And the only way someone could learn about the journey of death on the other side is to go there. And so what was drawn on the walls in Kemet, he taught, were part of the trip reports of the ancients going on to the other side and seeing pyramids, going to the other side and seeing people with hawks' faces and human bodies and jackal heads and human bodies. And the Egyptians were not, were not uh, embarrassed about their psychedelic use. In fact, they had specific traditions, like the traditions of Hathor that were associated with reverencing the apis bull and the dung that the scarab beetle would carry away like if you think about how much it would take of mushrooms for you to go and see a scarab beetle rolling dung down the street to make it into one of your the biggest gods of egypt you know to stand for so many principles you know outside of just it helps mushrooms to grow places where they otherwise wouldn't show up because it rolls and dries the dung in the sun and so the sun, the scarab beetle, and the sacred cow are all part of the mushroom's growing process, you know? And um, we see this tradition not just in Egypt, but in North Africa with cattle herders. We see it uh, in the Fulani people who also farm cattle, the Maasai people who also farm cattle. In cattle herding civilizations, mushrooms are a part of the everyday life. And if you're looking for food and you find something that's edible, that also is an exciting experience, then as a person on the plains of Africa, you're going to consider it, wow, this is really cool. You know, I just found something that plugs me into something that helps me to reframe whatever I've learned. Like, let's say you're a cow herder and you take mushrooms and all you know is about cattle. <clears throat> it's going to teach you different ways of humanely working with cows, like the Maasai who bloodlet their cows rather than just slaughtering them for their meat. Instead of slaughtering them, they figured out ways to keep their cows healthy by bloodletting them a certain time of the year, and they consume that blood fresh for iron and support, but it doesn't harm the cow. You know, it doesn't actually kill the cow, you know, and well, they're they like, why would you it, want put it? put it in a transfer so that it doesn't even feel the pain of the bloodletting. Yeah. Exactly. But is that something that you just think about? Like, if everyone else was just killing cows, like, man, our cows are going to go extinct now, man. I don't know what to do. And then you see the mushroom, and you eat some mushrooms, and you just have this trip thought, like, gee, I wonder if we can survive off that red stuff. Let's see. Um, I'm willing to see, you know, because everyone's like eating this stuff raw and some of them are getting sick. Like maybe the red stuff fresh. If it sits a day, we don't even want it. But <clears throat> if we drink it right out of the cow, then it doesn't have time to go, go bad. You know, like that sounds like something that would happen on a trip. And then you'd have this reverence for the blood and I don't know, maybe your cloth would be that color, you know, the Maasai color of cloth is that red of the cow's blood, you know, and they feel like they're, they're uplifted, um, as warriors, you know, to be able to go into the field and battle like the cow's the mother. And so this mother cow image is endogenous in many, many different traditions in Africa that worked with cow herding. And we see in Blombo's cave a hundred thousand years ago, there were cave paintings of cows, you know, uh, but not what we think of as cows, cows of that time period, post ice age, you know, the ice age didn't end in Europe till 11,700 years ago, but there are places in Africa a hundred thousand years ago that were inhabitable, you know, further South. And we see, you know, many different cave paintings, um, Tessaly plateau 10,000 years ago. Um, we see people actually herding cows, wearing pants and having mushroom head shapes, you know, and these are things that weren't just made up. These are, you know, venerated by anthropologists as, you know, proof of human civilization. You know, it's interesting to find the first or the earliest proof of human civilization has mushroom art embedded in it. 
And for me, that's what I was like, okay, I don't believe this. I'm going to research the crap out of this until I find out like for myself that that's really a thing that ever even happened. And when I found it out, I was like, well, let me test the rest of what he says, because I don't know about this whole alien versus predator thing. And it just became a ritual. Okay. I'm going to listen to his lecture. I'm going to take a bunch of mushrooms and see what happens. And one of those trips was a trip where I realized that he wasn't full of crap and that the information he was actually getting it from reputable sources and that my Western academic upbringing didn't really, it didn't give me the background to even understand most of what he was saying in a cultural or heritage context. I didn't know about warrior traditions. I didn't know about martial arts traditions. I knew about Taekwondo and Jiu Jitsu. You know, I didn't know that Africa even had martial arts, you know, or was considered Gedikbo or, you know, Aha Saki. Um, these traditions were carried from Africa into uh, Asia and they transformed over human migration patterns and information was exchanged from different warrior societies to other warrior societies. Um, and I think that even now in African world martial arts, we have folks from the Philippines working with people from uh, Ghana, working with people from America, you know, of all different backgrounds in African world martial arts. And every single one of them has a different technique that's honed uh, through their work uh, spiritually as well as their work in the community, as well as their unique uh, traditional teachings. There's only so many different ways you can break a human arm. And so every different culture has their own ways of breaking human arms and legs. You know, um, some, some do it and make it look really cool. Others do it and you wouldn't even know they were doing martial arts. It just looks like they did the funky chicken dance. And the guy's like busted on the floor. You know what I'm saying? Um, and that that funky chicken dance would be like some sort of sacred ritual between the warrior and say the falcon where he had to sit out in the bush watching falcons for days at a time on mushrooms inebriated or on Am amanita pantherina the warrior mushroom watching this animal in its fine-tuned motion and then replicating those motions to see how it hunts and kills its prey so eagle's fist was born ripping someone's throat out with your bare fingers you know gouging their eyes out, you know, um, being able to break their collarbone. These, these are all motions in Tamarian martial arts that are linked to um, the study of animals in their natural habitat um, as they relate to human speed and physiological advantage. Studying the animals are the prime predators and then picking up their abilities and translating it into the human. Um, and I, I didn't know that, that was a thing. I'm, I was just shocked. I was like, wow, this is like a whole new world of um, science. But it's martial arts science. It's cultural science. And it's it's anthropology, really. It's not even psychedelic science, you know, um, because even though psychedelics were involved, a lot of skill and discipline and training was involved as well. You know, it wasn't just you took a trip and you came out like this. It was you spent your whole life doing this to get to that point. Hmm. So, so I'm going to, I'm going to sort of like jump, jump in on the track here and see if I can uh, pull, pull the lever in a different direction. Um, so you've, you've got your, you know, you're doing your own deep investigation, your deep, your own deep journey work. Um, Kalindi's playing a significant role directly perhaps and, and indirectly <laughs> as someone who to eventually believe, but for quite a while to try to disprove. And, uh, are you talking about the sort of your training in debunking pseudoscience leaves me feeling like the two sort of sides of this are kind of like a, I've heard Jean Verbeke call it like parasitic processing, these kinds of like uh, maladaptive or erroneous models that can sort of reinforce themselves by distorting and warping our perception of things such that they can, they reaffirm the, the, the erroneous models and prevent any opportunity or capacity to change or transcend them. And one being this sort of like total incapacity to, to parse what you're hearing such that you can have a critical assessment of it. And the other one being so, uh, you know, so critical of things that it almost prevents the capacity to believe in anything that isn't, uh, you know, like physically verifiable. Uh, and I, I can definitely, I can definitely appreciate my own sort of unraveling 
out of the parasitic processing of uh, of staunt, unrelenting um, skepticism against anything perceivably pseudoscience. I, I have gone through. I have gone through, gone through a similar type journey. I think that's um, but, the the psychonauts um, guide to the galaxy. Um, again, and again, and dance as being a form of technology uh, that your f- body physiologically uh, is able to remember um, as being one method of connecting with the quantum entanglement of specific lifestyles in Orisha um, art and literature. So West African dance as a method of time travel is what I was talking about. Hmm. Um, cultural time travel, of course, um, into um, different archetypes of consciousness um, that were entangled with thought forms in the human brain. And um, I had fun. And it was, <laughs> it was a good lecture. Um, well, let, completely let me, let, theoretical, of course, but it was fun. Sure, sure. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to pause you there. I, at some point, the recording dropped out, so I don't know what I got of the lead up to that lecture, but I did get, uh, I did, I did get the description of your, we'll, we'll just call it your, your first band lecture, uh, which is true on multiple levels because it was banned and it was your first and it was your first band. <laughs> um, but, uh, I want, I, I wanted to sort of shift away from, from hearing about your journey towards and what you're exploring. There's, you have a number of different lectures on YouTube. I believe you have like a, a, a regular Facebook live thing that you do. And you'll even be speaking at the Spirit Plant Medicine Conference, which this uh, episode is partially sponsored by. I'll be there looking forward to meeting you in person. Um, that's coming up in a couple of weeks from this recording. I'll be there to serve you some bomb tea. Looking forward to it. Um, hopefully it will be a nice balm to the stress of travel. Uh, anyway, so... Um, Yes. So what I want to get into more so though, because people can look into your lectures, they can hear your thoughts on things around like quantum, uh, you know, quantum entanglement, these sort of, uh, you know, ancient African and Egyptian sort of like, uh, sp- spirituality and how it relates to the mushroom and deep mushroom work. But I want to, I want to go specifically to high dose psilocybin and kind of looking at it from like a practicality standpoint, Kalindi, you know, if on first pass, what would he be famous for? My sense is being one of the first people to publicly be like, yeah, I take 30, 40 plus grams of mushrooms. Um, there's value in taking mushroom doses, this high kind of thing. And um, you also speak to having seemingly most of your experiences or a good portion of your early experiences are all rather high dose, at least how I would I would characterize them. And I'm wondering, you know, out of your experiences, the journeys that you've gone, the learning that you've went through, the struggles I assume, you know, were inherent in exploring mushrooms at those doses. Have you found like, you know, what is your sense of the value of working with high doses of mushrooms? It's an art form. You know, it's like, do you want to enter the ring with um, George Foreman or um, Mike Tyson right off the bat, or do you want to practice first? You know? Um, and when I say practice first, I feel like people don't understand the value in doing high doses. And therefore, um, when they do the high dose for the wrong reason, i.e. the reason of just trying to do a high dose because they heard that someone somewhere had been doing it and they wanted to compare their experiences, um, I feel like that's never a really good reason to enter a boxing ring with an unknown opponent um, that could deck you and potentially cause you to um, not have any memory of the fight, <laughs> you know? Um, and it doesn't always have to be a fight. I feel like it can be play at the higher doses and it can be relaxing and it can be absolutely peaceful and empty. Like I, I've sat on 200 wet grams of Koisamoy super strain that I grew myself. And they were all about abort sized, you know, they were, they're about three quarter maturity. They hadn't, the veils hadn't broken yet, put it that way. Um, mature aborts kind of. And, um, everyone knows in the community that, you know, they reach a certain peak potency before they actually open, 
uh, their caps and spread spores. And uh, I'll tell you this, if you've got the mental fortitude, you can sit on a 20 gram equivalent trip, wet or dry, and experience absolute nothing. So, but what is it, what is the value of that? Like as, as somebody, important. cause, cause you, you come, you come back, you come back from that experience, mm-hmm. right? Like is, you, is the value you simply the experience or, you know, I mean, honestly, without a cultural framework to put it in, it, there is no value to doing a high dose of mushrooms. If you're not actually using some sort of goal, you know, uh, cause you could hurt yourself. You can hurt yourself trying to do a high dose of mushrooms without having some sort of um, parachute, so to speak, of practice that grounds you, that makes you feel um, at home in your body, at home with your senses. Um, And if you have no sense of home in your body or your senses without mushrooms, it's really improper for you to expect to do a higher dose of mushrooms and somehow immediately gain your footing in your mind or in your reality. And I think some people are doing a high dose because they're looking for that grounding. They're looking for gaining that footing. They're looking to learn something about themselves that's going to change the way that their mind and their body and their consciousness interfaces with this reality. And oftentimes on the other side, they find fear. They fear, They find malice. They find malevolent things in the world, not just beautiful things. And they find themselves challenged by their own actions, by the actions of those around them, and by the actions of things that they see in their experience that may have nothing to do with them physically. And so it's it's something that, just like an art form, what is what is the benefit of doing jujitsu to someone who doesn't do martial arts? It's hard, they got beat up, and it hurt. But to a martial artist, what is the value of doing jujitsu? It's a way of life. There's a warriorship aspect to it. There's also a self-improvement aspect to it. And there's also this enjoyment that naturally comes from being a martial artist and doing your favorite martial art and respecting your lineage and the teachers who came before you and their specific techniques at addressing punches and arm bars and headlocks. You know what I'm saying? Like You feel like you've done a good thing because you're keeping your teacher's knowledge in your heart and so when people just go off rip and say oh i want to do a high dose of mushrooms kalindi was putting high dose in the frame of in africa we don't measure doses the mushroom is a food for the soul for the spirit and it's you it's protected in women's circles and midwifery it's protected in martial arts and it's protected in the community as something that's reserved for exploration and for improvement, improvement of tradition, improvement of ethics, improvement of physical strength, improvement of knowledge. And in the West, we see this thing as a drug. So we're just trying to get high in the West. Or, so or we people. see it as a medicine to try to, or we see like, it, well, like now, said, and the fixing. I mean, I'm talking about like the, the original like 1960s mm. construct. We were introduced to it as a drug. Now we see it as a medicine. But Kalindi talked about it as a technology. He said, you don't have to be sick to take mushrooms. And to, to call it a medicine is to connotate that you need a medicine, that you're sick. Water can be medicine, but we don't call water medicine, you know? And mushrooms can be medicine, but it's not called medicine in different traditions where it comes from. And when I say where it comes from, I'm not saying that it doesn't come from everywhere because it comes from all over the world where there's landmass, you know, it's temperate for it to grow. But... In the context of Aztec philosophy, it's called Tionanakatl. But a lot of people call that the flesh of God. But God doesn't exist. The word God doesn't exist in Aztec vocabulary. In the framework of Aztec philosophy, as written by James Maffey, University of Maryland, Tiot or Ome Tiot is a non dual monistic concept that is an impersonal force that embodies everything. Aztec metaphysics is the ontological exploration of the experience of um, those things inside of our our world, the experience of um, metaphysical objects like humans, the experience of that being, whereas Western metaphysics is the subject-object exploration. How did this thing come about and what does it do? Aztec metaphysics is ontologically um, exploring the experience of uh, the object, what its beingness is, what it's experiencing in its existence. 
And so Tiot or Ome Tiot would be akin to saying an impersonal force that is all pervasive, i.e. it's everything. And it's also, um, it doesn't have some sort of goal. There's no sort of end time. It's just generating energy and motion and regenerating energy and motion and destroying energy at the same time. So it's not good or bad and it doesn't want to be good or bad. And so when we say Tionanakatol, we're saying the flesh of that, which has always existed because there's no cosmogony to the Aztecs. There's no beginning or end in creation. So we're not saying, oh, the flesh of the creator. We're saying the flesh of this timeless intelligence that everything is made up of, from the walls to the mushroom to the human. So you're going to enter the big flesh body basically. And what's interesting to me is that when you, when you ask about the value in context of the mushroom for people who are trying to get to know uh, their world or their reality, that's the value It's exploration. That's the value of doing a high dose so you get more time to explore After five grams, after 10 grams, I don't think the experience gets any more potent to the human brain. I just think the time period uh, gets longer. So if I want to do a high dose and I want eight hours with this vast, immeasurable expanse of everything that I don't know that exists beyond my physical, into the cosmos, beyond the cosmos, beyond this universe... I get eight hours with that if I do 15 grams versus I do four or five grams. I might get two hours exploring and like four hours coming up and two hours coming down. And that's what I don't think people understand about high doses is doing a high dose. Isn't just so we can wear a medallion and say, Oh, we did a high dose. It's for the purpose of bringing back information from this unimaginable reality that's around us. And Kalindi was really good as a martial artist at disciplining his mind and his body and learning different movements that were associate with the warrior traditions that he studied in Africa and academically to be able to operate on high doses as someone who can raise the mast, build a ship and sail on the ocean of infinity. He was not taking the mushroom for the purpose of conquering fear He was taking the mushroom to go into places where the consciousness of the human has never been before. He was basically like the Captain Kirk of the cosmos, but I'll I'll say Picard because I like Picard better. (laughs) But my my point is, no, no, no offense, Captain Kirk, if you're watching this, I love you too. But, you know, um, all of these concepts of of even the Starship Enterprise, I think it looks like a giant mushroom. It looks like a giant Rishi mushroom. Mm -hmm. And I feel like Um, personally for me, as someone who travels in hyperspace in those dimensions, um, I'll say, let me go ahead and refine what I just said. So it makes sense. I've had trips where according to the positioning of my body, I was able to feel tangibly, um, this sort of encompassing like egg around my body and, the visions, the visuals became like the mint, like the night sky on a perfectly sunny day. The whole room could go dark. Like I'm traveling, um, in Alpha Centauri or some other galaxy. And those kind of visuals are something that I think would be heavily desired by the ancients. You know, they weren't really trying to necessarily perhaps always trip in nature and outside just to see the trees. They knew that the trees existed, the trees had spirits, and they respected the tree spirits. So after you've had a certain amount of trips in a certain set and setting, eventually you want something new. You want to go out beyond the trees. You want to go out beyond the comfort of your forest home into the vast expanse of the cosmos and find life beyond this planet so you can help the people who are in your tribe or culture evolve and receive technology human curiosity is the most all-pervasive force i think on our planet and curiosity is something that after childhood is not as encouraged um in different african villages this curiosity is a driving force of life 
those who are curious, those who want to explore, are the ones who bring beautiful things back to teach. And teaching is a vocational art that different African spiritual advisors in a village environment, like let's say I grew up in Liberia, in a village like uh, Sabanfu Some, uh, Maladoma Some's wife. She gave a lecture that was transmitted to me by someone who I know close to me, uh, where she talked about the fact that once you turned 18, you were to be married to someone who had the same spiritual goals as you when you were born. When the child was born, the mother would be channeling the voice of the child coming through her, what the child's goal was to do in the village. So if the child said it wanted to be a teacher at birth, then when you got to be 18 years old, you were placed with another teaching spirit, you know, as your partner, as your, as your mate. And I think that these traditions are bastardized in the West because we think, well, they were controlled. They were put in arranged marriage. That's horrible. But because bodies are not sexualized in, in that context, in the village context, People are not looking to make, mate based on attraction. They're looking to have uh, a relationship where they can fulfill their life's work and their, their childhood is built to support their purpose in life. And I think that's what many of us in the West are missing is a life's purpose. And I think the mushroom for me, the way high doses influenced me was so that I could go out and to go in to myself. I wanted to find out what acacia was. What is my humanity? What is my womanhood? What is my queerhood? What is my experience on this planet got to do with anything at all? And does it matter? And I found out that yes, it matters. Yes, I am some sort of being that has gifts to share with others. And it helped me to ask the right questions of myself so that I could rise to the occasion of my purposehood. And that's what I think the value has been for me. Hmm. And and if I if I get this right, this is I mean perhaps for you, but perhaps maybe more generally, you're sort of framing this in the same way, uh, like you're framing it through the lens of martial arts. Like these these mm-hmm. journeys into the into the high dose is a sort of like, well, this is my language, but like testing the metal of like what's possible oh, yeah. and yeah. that it is it is in the challenge of going there it is in the challenge of being there that mm-hmm. uh, that you're sort of encountering this thing or experiencing this thing that you have attributed the value you just you just shared um and that it's it's not like going there and it's given to you it's like going there is itself a sort of like apex challenge like uh like what's what's this I wanted to say something before I lost it because yeah. I might lose this train of thought. My dad and I share the same neurosis. <laughs> hmm. I was raised by a man who is a mathematician and a chess player. My dad spends four to six hours a day playing chess with the AI with Stockfish 4 and Stockfish 3. And if you've ever played chess, these AIs will decimate you in 15 seconds. He is trying to memorize blindfolded not only the chess board but the chess pieces and learn every possible opening ending and middle game connection that there is on the board my dad's played blindfold chess with me while i was driving my car literally asking me if i move pawn c4 to c6 and my queen out what is the opening what is what is the gap to put my king in check and i've got to do these complex visualizations that make buddhist Vajrayana Tantra look easy with my own father. Like my dad is a fucking genius. I mean, excuse my language, dad. Sorry. But my dad's a genius, you know? And so because he looks for those challenges in his life, it inspired me to challenge myself in the mental arena. Rather than doing martial arts physically, I'm doing martial arts on what could be considered a spiritual level with myself, with my own ego or my own lower tendencies, my my anger, my aggression, my hatred, my grief, my greed, my jealousy, all these your fear versions of acacia that exist inside of myself. I was able to utilize the mushroom as a go-between to help me to engage and learn about these forms so I didn't automatically demonize aspects of myself, my shadow, my darkness. And that's what helps me to be able to engage with people I care about. And be very direct with my feelings and emotions. Sometimes I might not be nice about it. And I got to work on being more gentle with my approach. 
But that's a far cry from being someone who would just go off. Like when I was in the military, I had an anger disorder, you know, that was born of extreme frustration and pressure. And a lot of people in the military have explosive anger disorder where you go and talk to an MTI and you say the wrong thing. And then 15 seconds later, you're getting read your rights on a whole nother level of aggression than you're used to. And that's something that we are taught to normalize in the military is in a moment of emergency. If somebody tells you to go and do something and you don't follow that order, you're going to die. And so that's the kind of intensity I brought you know, out of the military when I no longer had the military to back me up. You know, I wasn't going to be a captain at at 21 years old. I wasn't going to go to the Air Force Academy because that's what I was selected to do. And so taking the mushroom helped me to go into those experiences that as a civilian, I I don't have any use being hyper aggressive and hyper serious and hyper direct all the time. You know what I'm saying? So it helped me to reframe those learned aspects of my personality into someone who was a community member who could be genial, who could be gentle and, you know, not an OCD rage head, you know? I mean, people who know me now would not even imagine the kind of person I was 10 years ago, you know, because that person has gone through so many changes psychologically. Um, Challenging myself emotionally has been much more interesting than traveling the cosmos because you can travel the outer realms all day and go nowhere and see lots of beautiful things but going into the inner realms of responsibility and the relationship between self and action is really interesting because it will show you what you consume psychologically is what comes out of your mouth a lot of the times. So a lot of times you'll tell people what you've been doing based on the things that just come out of your mouth and thought forms that you just don't really think too much of. So it taught me how to do mental dieta, how to do social dieta, and how to protect my 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 psyche from things that were very toxic to me, like pornography, you know, that's something that I was very addicted to in my youth came with the advent of going to the college campus and getting on the computer, typing in a kid's site like Webkinz and then it leading directly to like a family of, you know, having sex and all sorts of weird shit. You know, that's something that it impacted me psychologically as a kid. And so for people who have that hypersexuality and that hypersexual trauma, taking mushrooms can help you to rec- recognize your miseducation about what love should look like and what love can look like. And it helped me to stop associating so much that my straightness was my human value, that me being with a man of a specific body size and type or even penis size was what I wanted in life. And of course, you know, someone would say, oh, well, is that when you decide to be queer? And I'm like, well, no, that's when I started to start looking into people spiritually and looking at their character. When I say spiritually, I'm not talking about something that doesn't exist. I'm talking about their actions. So I started looking at people's actions rather than their phys- physiological value to me. And that's when I stopped um, calling myself anything. I'm not queer. I'm not straight. I'm just, I'm just me. Because I give people the ability to express themselves in my life. And I'm looking at their expression as an attractive expression rather than looking at them externally as being more valuable because of their characteristics that I find enticing or attractive. And so that's one way I've done battle with myself because my previous self was very interested in men of a certain height. I think everyone has a type, I guess you could say. And I had a type that was based on what I saw in not only social media, but TV and pornography. And it was reinforced constantly by magazines. It was reinforced like, oh, that's the hot guy type. And then I realized that that was the most superficial, mundane experience um, based on a very narrow lens of trained uh, behaviors. I was basically kind of set up by what I was consuming psychologically to tell myself that this is the only thing that I want. And then I realized what I really wanted was what I subconsciously associated with those images, which was safety or security or abundance or, you know, really kind, uh, generous behavior. I was associating facial expressions of smiling 
with warmth and mirth and good energy. When honestly, when I actually dated some of these people who looked like those people, the opposite type of behaviors are what they exemplified. And so even just in a basic mundane thing like human attraction, that was a battle for me with myself. You know, and doing a high dose of mushrooms, you might have 20 different battles. You might have the battle of human attractiveness versus what your what you really want, what your purpose is in this life. You might have the battle of dealing with uh, fear. You know, you might realize that you were still holding in your body physically fear of dying based on an experience you had when you were 12. Or in my case, an experience I had when my head, uh, when I threw myself on the ice, basically, during a uh, ice skating recital when I was like six or seven years old and practically cracked my skull. Um, there are different fears that come from run-ins with the unknown. And so when you go out into the unknown, expecting to encounter fear and discomfort, um, you find different ways to open yourself up for not carrying so many weights, so much baggage um, of your own psyche, of your own personality. Um, and it seems like we can't help it. We're like sponges. We can't help but absorb what we're around, which is why it's so important for us to have good community and elders and friends who are not toxic people in our lives because we absorb the qualities of those who we're around. Just like we can absorb the qualities of someone negative, we can also absorb the qualities of people who are positive. And I think that's why having a healthy community is so important to doing high dose work because of the people you're around are harming themselves and others on even a subtle level of even just for their own money use or for their own psychological or emotional use, using people, um, eventually you're going to become like who's leading you. So if you see people in your community who are causing harm on any level, it's best to distance yourself from them so that you can become very clear about what your role is so that you don't become entrapped in the mental structures that they've created for themselves. Um, I found myself entrapped in really messed up mental structures, hanging out with people who really, um, who really had been hurt in such a way where they didn't care about other people. And I found myself hardening because of that. Um, and the softening process really only happened when I went and spent time alone and with people who were more open-minded and gentle and willing to give other people chances, you know, um, so yeah, that's just like one practical example, like outside of the psychedelic narrative that I've literally used to help guide my path in life away from something that I believe to be dangerous behavior that I was doing. Hmm. I mean, you gave several examples um, in that of like ways in which you're, you know, working with uh, high dose with mm -hmm. mushrooms in general in this sort of, uh, you know, martial arts of doing battle with maybe yourself, but also maybe your own resistance as to what is <laughs> dancing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, as you said, you know, dance, dance can quickly turn into a uh, battle, uh, at least in the African traditions, like you, like you had said earlier, but um, yeah, so that's, I mean, that's all, that's all very insightful and interesting. Um, now I had something else in mind, but I'm, I'm feeling inclined to ask this here. Like in, in the midst of this, you talked about almost how you were, you know, liberated um, through, through this dance, through these, this, uh, high level. Almost. Uh, I was absolutely liberated. I wasn't talking to my parents for like seven years because of how much I was upset with them about how they treated me for my relationships, you know, off and on, barely talking, barely even having a conversation it really helped me to learn forgiveness. Like, you know, when we talk about things spiritually, a lot of times just up in the air, kind of fluff, like, ah, things are so spiritual. But what I'm talking about is my actions. I feel like that's what really defines me as a human being is who I show up with in the external world, who, how I show up, you know? And I was talking to my, my partner about this the other day. I want to show up the way that I want people to show up for me. So if I don't show up the way that I expect others to show up as, if I have no expectation of them and I just show up authentically the way that I want to be treated, that's going to rub off positively. You know, it's like, it's like if you see people making a bunch of negative Facebook posts, after a while, you're going to think they're a negative person. Same with people who just come up and have a really toxic energy. If they're always trying to borrow money or 
you know, they're, they're trying to, to take advantage of a situation or they're just always sad about something, you know? Sure. For me, or, or, or like trans transform to be such a way due to the influences yeah. of the people around them or the influences of the of the sort of I think you said like a like a psychic dieta or something, but like the influences yeah. of the content that they're being fed through algorithmic means when most of their mm -hmm. interactions are existing on a social media platform, either with other human beings mm -hmm. or, you know, with content, you know, right. de detached content. Yeah, I realized that I wanted to take a different path that was older. You know, because I feel like I'm not throwing the baby out with the bath, uh, bath water here when I say this. But for me, I wanted to learn how to be someone who when people spend time with me, they feel safe. And be someone that when people are around me, they feel supported by my being there. That when I show up, I'm thinking about their needs and I'm also nourishing myself when I'm not around them so that it doesn't become a hardship on me to give to others. Um, that's why I'm a tea master. It's because if I want to have a long, drawn-out conversation with someone, I know I'm going to want tea. And if they like tea, then I'll serve them tea, and we'll talk, and we'll be relaxed, and we'll chill. You know, I can't smoke weed, so this is basically the next, next best thing for me because I don't, I don't really smoke cannabis. It's just too sensitive to it. Hmm. Well, let, let me get let me get back on my initial track here after your your sort mm -hmm. of correction of my perspective or my suggestion of you know almost liberated, fully liberated from from certain things. As you mm -hmm. you spoke about you know lip being liberated from the old mm, labels, caricatures, uh, mm -hmm. you know, boxes you were trying to fit in or have or or fit get into your life in some way or another, um, and that the sort of like capacity to simply maybe be yourself without those labels, those boxes, those expectations, those concepts of sort of guiding um, who, who you think that you need to be. Mm -hmm. And I can appreciate how liberating that is. I could also sort of see how, you know, pardon the language here, that's all well and good for you, but that's not how other people will see you when mm -hmm. you show up in a public forum. Because, mm -hmm. you know, it is totally natural, normal, and like, you know, biologically, neurologically ingrained in us that we assess the world through higher order representations, stereotypes, schemas, etc. That's how our brain saves energy, gets us into lots of trouble, <laughs> you know, in a lot of ways. A lot of times it could be quite toxic. I feel like it's but, a good way to teach. But it's, but it's also just how we, how we end up perceiving people. That's the first, that's the first pass, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, if we're mature enough, we give ourselves the opportunity to be wrong um, and then to learn who these people really are. Um, yeah. Now, the, part. <laughs> right now here's, here's, here's where I'm going with this is that um, as someone in the public sphere, speaking on psychedelics, you're going to be subject to the models, stereotypes, schemas that other people have for you. And I'm wondering, and we spoke a little bit about this question before the interview kind of began. I'm wondering if you could speak to a bit of what it has been like for you to step into the sort of public sphere of, you know, maybe you don't agree with this term, but like advocacy or education around psychedelics um, as a black woman. It's been... It's been fun. Um, and I say that with a very serious tone. Um, not the kind of fun you'd expect. People who don't want to give me a chance learn a lot from me because of their reaction to me. And I teach through appearances. I found that out through my studies with Buddhism, that the path that I'm on is not an easy path. And I found it out through my Lakota elders and other spiritual people in my life who told me that I have a specific kind of purpose. And that purpose is to teach through experiences and to dissolve illusions. So a lot of people are going to create illusions naturally about me, and I'm at peace with that. And when they eventually take their mushrooms, or if they don't take their mushrooms, or just experience life with me, they're going to find out that the stereotypes they made about me aren't true. And it's going to make them question 
their perception of reality. Just a little bit. Just enough little bit of grit to polish a pearl. Like, I'm the sand in the, in the oyster shell that either pisses people off or eventually they see the fruit of it, the pearl, and they really, really, really appreciate it. Because it, you know, Kalindi E opened doors for people like me to have a voice. But it also means that people who have been historically known in the community, um, famous mycologists who have mycology degrees, et cetera, look at me automatically as someone who's in counterculture or in that spiritual woo-woo consciousness culture. And the truth is, uh, to them, I am. And that's just fine. Because I am a citizen scientist. And eventually, I will have several PhDs. As a matter of fact, I'm applying to UC Berkeley's psychedelic facilitation program next year, and I'll be going to Harvard as well. I was accepted to Harvard when I was 12 years old, and I don't plan to just stop with my academic career. Whatever they think about me is going to be shattered, and it's not going to matter 20 years from now when I'm doing the best work I can for my community. People's opinions of me really don't matter to me, even though sometimes their assumptions hurt. And I give it permission to hurt because I know that I've also been someone who made false assumptions about someone else. I eventually, like we talked about earlier, uh, came to really appreciate, like Kalindi. I made a lot of assumptions about him. And through my assumptions, I learned that I was absolutely wrong and that I didn't really know anything that I thought I knew about pseudoscience, let alone about older forms of science or exploration that exist. If you Google theoretical physics, the first Wikipedia ad says the ancient Greeks and Romans were the first people to actually explore the ontological relationship of our universe. And I found out through history that that's absolutely not true. So theoretical physics is based on a Western philo uh, philosophical point of view that was birthed by Aristotle and Plato and all of Socrates. But there are tons of philosophers, including African philosophers and Aztec philosophers and Taoist philosophers, who, whose philosophies could have built a natural science of our world that we completely ignore because of Western elitism. Uh, we think that Western philosophy is one thing and that no other philosophy should be considered as civilized, i.e. civilization. And so I'm the one who's going to do my, my best for the next 30 or 40 years, if I have that long, um, to learn as much as I can about alternate views, because I know that I have blind spots even right now that I can't even name. And those blind spots are going to create a cultural insensitivity to other people's views or notions about reality, and also my views and notions of reality as a result. So what I think right now is... The best way that I can be of service is to remain completely present and not get lost on what people see me as. Because the second I get lost in what people see me as, I lose myself. Do, do you feel as though there's a, there's like a, like you said, you said, you know, doing your best for your community. I'm not sure, you know, how or who you identify as being a part of that community. Human community. Do you feel as though you have sort of like, that you have some sort of uh, you know responsibility to your yes. your sort of dem your demographic your you know yeah. your, your being in the public sphere as a black woman. Do you feel like you like you have a I, responsibility to other black women in psychedelic culture or even in general? Um, yes, because of your position of 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 public capacity. I feel like um, I want to do Kalindi's legacy, honor and justice, and represent as someone who isn't out here trying to make money off people, isn't trying to spread a bunch of uh, psychotic conscious rumors about what the nature of reality is. I want to be known as someone who was an explorer and a traveler, just like Kalindi was, just as an explorer though, because that's what I do. It's, I'm, I'm a curious mind and I love a challenge. And I've always been that way. I even asked my parents, even when I was a tiny little kid before I ever knew psychedelics existed. My mom named me this, Acacia. And Kalindi was the first person who could pronounce Acacia correctly that I saw on YouTube, you know? And I, many people weren't talking about Acacia Confucia back then. I didn't even know about Acacia Confucia until I was like in my late teens. And a lot of people assume that I've named myself this. A lot of people assume 
that somehow I think I'm better than anyone else. And I don't. And for me, it, it's more about being a good example of someone who has left specific toxic feelings and emotions that were hurting my life, like depression and suicidal depression, behind and help others who are feeling suicide and depressed to find beauty in this world and find some sort of way to explore their purpose and so that they can live their purpose and live well. And I feel like, you know, like one of my best friends the other day called me and was like, yeah, I'm thinking about committing suicide. And I've had many friends commit suicide. I've had four friends die this year, uh, one of suicide. And they're very close friends, friends I've known for over 10 years or 15 years. You know, um, I'm about to go to the Atlanta psychedelic conference where we're honoring my friend, Chief Nighthawk, Tellus Johnson, worked with San Pedro and Mushrooms, you know, and was very well regarded in his Atlanta community for his work, um, bridging the gap between Native American and African heritage, because there's a huge link in this country. Um, you know, my own grandfather was a Chickasaw freedman, you know, um, James Smith. And so for me, it's, uh, it's one of those things where I feel like I have a responsibility to show up in a way that uses Occam's razor. I'm not out here trying to share a bunch of nonsense, you know, and I'm not out here to try and give tarot card readings either. I'm, I'm serious about my work. This is my life. And I feel like part of why I'm here is to help people to self-initiate, self-explore, um, self-actualize, and self-empower. Um, because I'm just a person exploring like anyone else. And I think that people are looking for other people to hold their hand and to teach them how to do these things. But the truth is, it's not for me to teach. It's for, it's for the person to teach themselves. I feel like that is the only way I really learned. I wasn't taking Kalindi's teachings just so that I could say I knew something. I was taking Kalindi's teachings so that I could go and find out for myself. And that's what he encouraged. He never encouraged his ideas be accepted as reality. He encouraged that people went and explored those realities for themselves and made their own conclusions based on experience. And honestly, if that's not a psychedelic, uh, psychedelic science, I don't know what is. Do you feel concerned that um, your sort of like em emphatic sort of sharing of how positive your high dose experiences have impacted your life and sense of self might be might accidentally, you know, create the harm of glorifying or, you know, high doses? It's already it's already a thing like we spoke about previously around like uh, there being like weird Reddit threads and before that DMT nexus threads and before Always that Always going to be knuckleheads. Right? For for the big doses. And there's even this kind of like uh, this thing in the Western academic world of just like the apex, most helpful, most healing it's psychedelic experiences. People the, want power. And yeah. so they're going to make mistakes. You know, I mean, honestly, the whole high dose thing was around long before I came around and before Kalindi came into the circles. You know, there's always going to be people out there who are knuckleheads. And I'm, I tell people all the time, this is not for everyone. What did I say in the beginning of this? If going up against Mike Tyson is what you want to do, then you might get beat up. You might, you know, you might in, end up leaving home on a stretcher because you did something really stupid on a very high dose of mushrooms. You know, you could harm yourself and others if you're if you're not doing it wisely, if you're not taking your time and going up small dose at a time. And if people don't listen to that, if they choose to selectively listen and just hear all that I'm saying is emphatically high doses are good, then just like someone who drank a bunch of beers, goes out and kills a mother and her two children, every, every couple of weeks, we have more alcohol deaths and more fentanyl-related deaths and more cocaine-induced deaths than any other psychedelic drugs that have ever been on the market. If somebody decides to do a high dose and learn some respect for the mushroom, I'm not upset. Because just like people do stupid things with cigarettes and stupid things with alcohol, it's bound to happen. I mean, 
ask me the same thing. What about all the advertisement in the United States saying that, oh, you know, you, you, you should go ahead and buy a Corona light or Michelin Ultra and then, you know, go to the game with your friends. A lot of people take that to mean, oh, I need six Corona lights. I need 10 Michelin Ultras. And by the end of the night, you're stumbling outside of the bar and they're, they're found pissed out, passed out, drunk or dead in their own vomit the next day. That doesn't happen with psilocybin mushrooms uh, on the on the level that it happens with alcoholism. So what does it matter that there are going to be people out there who learn respect by having a very difficult experience? They could literally have died having a high dose of alcohol. Hmm. It's it's interesting because like it feels sort of uh, it feels kind of like in opposition to the sort of like. Uh, uh, maybe maybe I'm misperceiving this, but like uh, opposition to this sort of like care that you want to bring to your work and this sort of like, um, you know, like, oh, well, you know, people are going to be knuckleheads and get themselves hurt. Probably better to hurt themselves on mushrooms than to kill themselves as somebody else behind the wheel of a car after six Coronas. And like, certainly the, the I would say it is a better outcome to be, mm -hmm. you know, somewhat traumatized by a bad, uh, you know, pardon me, bad mushroom experience. I've then, had difficult you know, mushroom experiences because I didn't return my library books. <laughs> I've had hard yeah, high yeah, doses I because yeah. I lied to my girlfriend. I've had bad high doses because I decided to get behind my car and go buy some brisket and orange juice after a high dose trip and I wasn't down all the way. I've had trips like that. And you know what each one taught me? Every single bad trip that I've ever had in my fucking life that I need to be more accountable and show up in a better way. And you know what? It was good for me. And if it's bad for me to wish that someone learns from their mistakes in a way that embarrasses them a little bit, maybe they shat themselves on the bed because they did 30 grams, then honestly, it's a lot better than what's happening out there in the world. I, In this lecture, in this podcast, I've captured the way that is doing it respectfully. And if people purposefully choose not to listen to that, then they're absolutely acting out of ignorance. And there's always going to be ignorance in this world. I can't do anything to stop ignorance. Ignorance doesn't need an excuse. That's why it's ignorant. <laughs> I love that ignorance doesn't need an excuse. <laughs> yeah. But for mm. those who really want to do it respectfully, they're going to listen because they want to do it respectfully. And free will exists. Who am I to tell people? Oh, if you don't do it respectfully, there's going to be, you know, I'm not going to be happy with you. No, I've done it disrespectfully, as in disrespecting myself. I disrespected myself by taking a large dose before I actually did some sort of self-inquiry as to why I wanted to do mushrooms at all that day. What was I greeted with? All the shit I was avoiding in my mind, that's what I was greeted with. And then I learned to be more accountable to my thoughts and what I digest in my mind, started seeing bombs going off everywhere. Well, then I stopped watching the news every day. I thought nuclear explosions were going to happen. Well, then I stopped following uh, the disaster playlist on YouTube about the apocalypse. I unsubscribed from shit that was poisoning my mind with fanaticism. And I, I encourage other people to do that as well. Hmm. And I'm wondering where the how do how we slide into home plate here in this call. Um, yeah, I mean it's it's yeah. I'm actually at a little bit of a loss around it. You know, initially, you know, I wanted to. I had the sense that I wanted to recreate perhaps the conversation we had in the last one, and in hindsight, I realized like obviously that's impossible, um, and I'm. You know, I'm, I'm happy and I'm interested in, in what's come through this. And uh, I guess I'm also happy and interested in uh, getting a chance to hear what you have to say. Like we, we talked a lot about your, you know, your personal, a little bit in the beginning on your research, but a lot about the sort of personal impact of having this, of doing this kind of high dose work in your life. And, um, and from what I understand, most of the things that you have out there are actually about the sort of like the object of the study that isn't necessarily yourself. And coming up at the Spirit Plant Medicine Conference, you're giving a talk again on something that is an object of your research that isn't necessarily yourself, which I'm excited about. And you're welcome to you know share the abstract for now for people to entice them to check out the conference. Um, and I'm also just feeling... I'm feeling, uh, you know, a, a level of gratitude and appreciation for an opportunity to talk with you again. Um, maybe that's 
Maybe that's my slide into home base. <laughs> you know, we think uh, mushrooms are a harsh teacher. Try Mother Nature out for size. You know, um, there's a lot of violence and death and scary things outside, you know, in the wild, so, so to speak. We live in civilization, and so we think that we're protected until, you know, somebody gets bit by a feral animal and ends up with rabies and dies, you know, or something, you know. And mushrooms have been on this planet so long that our earliest human ancestors had to have come into contact with them, even in the midst of an appropriate set and setting, like war or like animals, you know, in the wild, hunting them or people hunting animals, you know, where there's bloodshed and, you know, all this other stuff. We, we get so caught up on ceremony and about pomp and, and purpose. And I mean, even the conversation where you're like, you know, that seems to detract away from, you know, what you're saying about, you know, sensitivity and compassion, et cetera, in the space. Not to like contrast. Yeah. Yeah. It is a contrast because just like on the mushroom, there are very malevolent and malicious themes that come up sometimes. And I don't want to fool people into thinking that it's a cakewalk. It's not a cakewalk. And that's why you should take caution. Caution is wisdom. But for those who don't take caution, sometimes you got to earn that wisdom. And that's okay, too, because I've been there. I've literally freaking been there. Um, so my lecture at Vancouver is going to be about how humans can help people evolve. And that's from here on up. This isn't talking about the past. This isn't trying to come up with some stone date theory. You know, this is about how right now, based on the climate of politics in our country, based on the climate of the world, climate change, based on the wars that are going on, how can humans evolve from where we're at? And I'm just going to come up with some theories and uh, some information based on how humans have interacted with psilocybin mushrooms in the past, based on uh, uh, social evolution, sharing information, becoming more gregarious and more open to new ideas, how we can open ourselves up to ideas that could potentially help more people than ourselves. Um, I'm also going to talk about, um, the ritual use and instruments or say the fancy props or the interdimensional tools, whichever side of the board you want to be on, um, and what their history is in respect to mushroom use, specifically stones outside of metaphysics of stones and books that are written in the fifties and sixties around the energies of stones. I'm going to ground it back to how stones may have been used as a technology or an ingenious prop for uh, purifying uh, the human mind uh, so that you can focus on going um, out or in to the multiverse, whichever way you want to think about it. Um, I say out or in uh, because it's all exploration and it really doesn't matter whether you think you're going out or whether you're going in and you're closing your eyes and you're out there. Uh, we know that we are having an experience real time. And so the stones for me have been an indispensable tool because uh, Kalindi utilized them to store maps. And a lot of people say, well, what's a map and a crystal got to do with your mushroom trip? You know, isn't that external? You know, isn't the mushroom inside your head? And um, based on the definition of Aztec philosophy, Tion and Akadol, the flesh of God, um, entering the flesh of God would mean entering the experience of the crystal. Um, because the crystal would also be synonymous with teot, synonymous with your hand, synonymous with the table. And so if you're entering the experience of what is beyond your physical vessel, the all, let's just put it that way, then the crystal would be part of the all. And its experience would be unique based on its composition as being a crystal. And so Kalindi was utilizing uh, the mushroom to access specific vibrational states of consciousness while working with these stones and storing the signature imprint of those locations inside of the crystal, similar to how you would program a CDRW disc. And a lot of people say, oh, there goes the pseudoscience again. You lost me. Um, how That's not even possible. A human body can't write light on a disc. Light language doesn't exist, whatever. And, and sure, none of that stuff exists. Fine. Whatever. But if you look at stones as having a self-similar uh, six-sided geometry, 
a lot of these images about the flower of life and people seeing a flower of life on mushrooms makes sense when we put it into the context of um, the nature or the fractal nature of reality itself. So everything considering itself being fractal in nature means that there are repeating patterns and these repeating patterns get smaller and smaller and continue to repeat themselves. And so what would you need to potentially store information? You would need a repeating pattern that's stable enough that it's not going to change its shape even when information is added to it. So silicon dioxide is really good at in supercomputers and in quantum computers because you can pass information into it and through it and repetitively access those same packets of data um, potentially on the hard drive. Now, if the hard drive breaks, we know what happens. You stop being able to access it. I know exactly how it happens. (laughs) Yeah, and so, you know, uh, once the crystal breaks, you know, you have to start over. And of course, my crystal from Kalindi has broken several times. And the cool part about it was, um, depending on where I was looking in the stone when I was having those experiences, I was really quantumly entangling parts of the stone with specific memories inside my own brain. So when I look at the stone in a specific location, I would go into that memory, which would then start a process of bringing that vibrational energy into the trip. And it, it's been very effective as a focusing tool, as a fancy prop, um, as well as a metaphor for having a clean mind, a crystal mind or crystal diamond consciousness in Buddhism, diamond vajra consciousness. Um, and uh, as far as the metaphysics of it, um, stones have been historically used to uh, store information from uh, the temples, the hieroglyphs, uh, to um, different megalithic sites around the world, uh, symbolically. Now, I'm going to, go- I'm going to, I'm going to pause you there because I imagine this is also the thing that you're going to be sharing at the spirit plant medicine conference. Um, and I'm also excited to sort of, uh, somewhat, uh, cheeky way, get people who are really interested in what you're about to say a bit agitated and inclined towards perhaps checking you out at the conference. Um, uh, with that, you know, I will share some information about how people can, you know, listen to your talk at the conference, either live or digitally live or after the recording, depending on when they're listening to this. Um, I'll do that in the outro. How can people follow your work generally, though, if they want to be like, hey, I like what Acacia had to say today. How do I how do I stay in tune with uh, with the things that she's doing? Where would you direct them to do that? Well, I have a school. Um, I created a school for people who wanted to explore cultural anthropology in the psychedelic space, where every month we'll go over different civilization um, and culture. Uh, This month, I was teaching Aztec philosophy. Uh, The last class of this month is on Friday, and we went over the book In-Depth Aztec Philosophy by James Maffey and the full definitions of specific Aztec themes, symbols, and uh, ritual beliefs. Uh, Next month, we're going over African philosophy, and I'll be speaking about Credo Mutua and specific oneriogenic traditions that are working with dream herbs and psychedelics uh, to access altered states of consciousness and healing the African-American religion wound, which seems to be very prevalent in my community. Um, And so you can reach me at Instagram at Acacia Lewis, A-C-A-C-E-A-L-E-W-I-S. In my link in bio, you can see what classes I'm offering. Um... Uh, each month is $100. So if you want to come and if you don't have 100 bucks, then send me a DM and I'll probably give you a scholarship or um, try to work with you so I can find out a way to get you the information or resources you're looking at for free. Um, and uh, yeah, I teach full time and Divine Master Alchemy is a school that studies different alchemical tools that masters of ancient times or modern times have utilized to access divinity studies. Um, whether that's spiritual or metaphysical uh, or supernatural or natural, which, which, whichever way you want to describe it and whatever paradigm interests you. Um, so, yep, that's uh, how to reach me. So Acacia Lewis uh, on Instagram or mm-hmm. I assume on Facebook as well, uh, they can mm-hmm. find you. Right? Um, Acacia, thanks so much for your time today, uh, for the work that you're doing. 
um, and especially too for taking the time a second time very much to help compensate for my poor data management. <laughs> um, so very much, very much appreciate that. Well, um, I'll teach you at the Vancouver conference how to store your trips uh, in stone. So unless you break the stone, you won't lose your trips. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, talk about uh, different ways we can show up better for ourselves and, and uh, humanity in the future through how humans can evolve with mushroom use. Thank you so much, James, for having me on your podcast. I really appreciate you making time today. And I hope that this gets saved. <laughs> Don't worry. I've got so many redundancies set up now. Um, yeah. Thanks. Thanks so much, Acacia. No worries, man. And cut. Okay. That is all for this interview with uh, Acacia Lewis. I hope you enjoyed. Uh, again, follow up with her work. Uh, links to her social media channels on Instagram and Facebook will be in the show notes to this episode, either at jameswgesso.com or directly linked over to jameswgesso.com in uh, you know the caption of this, wherever, wherever you're listening to it. If you're finding value in the show, of course, helping to contribute to its production through a financial means would be wonderful. Uh, and you could do that through Patreon or through some one-time uh, donation options. Or you can just follow me on Patreon or on social media. Uh, ideally Patreon, because then you don't have to, I guess, rely on the algorithms to keep you in contact with what I'm producing. Uh, but I also have a Telegram channel and a newsletter. So all of that are in the description to this episode, wherever, wherever you're checking it out. So jump over there, follow me, uh, become a part of the Patreon community, whatever floats your boat. You could also just share this episode. That's helpful too. If you're interested in learning more about uh, sacred plants and working with sacred plants, an excellent opportunity would be to participate in the Spirit Plant Medicine Conference happening November 3rd to the 5th. Who helped sponsor this uh, this interview? Uh, you can head to jameswgesso.com forward slash SPMC, and uh, that's linked in the description here. And you can use the promo code ADVENTURES, A-D-V-E-N-T-U-R-E-S, for 30% off your ticket in person or virtual. And uh, yeah, if you're going to be there in person, come up and say hello, because I will be there and I'm very excited about it. I haven't been out west in a long time and I live on the east side of Canada, or well, east of center, very east if you're from the west. Um, and it's going to be really nice to be out by the ocean again. Uh, it's a beautiful land, beautiful campus, and a beautiful collection of people that put that conference on. So I'm happy to be there and looking forward to seeing you if you're there. Um, but we could you know, simultaneously be learning at the same time if you attend virtually as well. So that's all. This is uh, this has been Adventures Through the Mind, episode 182 with Acacia Lewis. Hope you found value in it, and I look forward to seeing you on the next episode. And until then, take care. <laughs>